talk of other universes has become fashionable amongst physicists and apparently also amongst you, given the book sales. Um, but when you look at the, the theories, the, the numbers hardly seem credible. String theory, for example, predicts there need to be 10 to the 500 parallel universes. That's 10 followed by 500 zeros. To give you an idea of how big that is, if you counted up all the particles in the known universe, it comes to a paltry 10 to the 80. That's a lot of universes. And some people argue that just the idea of other universes is nonsensical. So, should we recognize that ours is actually the only universe and give up on the others as just some kind of fantasy science? Or is the idea of slipping through a wormhole into another universe actually credible rather than just a Hollywood fairy tale? Well, to help us navigate those questions, um, our panelists. On um, my right, we have Kumran Vapa, um, physicist, recipient of the prestigious Dirac Medal and the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Um, on my left, Mary Jane Rubinstein, um, professor of religion at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, USA. And then on, on my far left, John Ellis, um, Maxwell Prize winning theoretical physicist um, who since 1978 has had held an indefinite contract at CERN and there's a lot of mutterings that when he leaves no one will know how the machine actually works. <laughs> <laughs> He's now at King's College I believe, is that right? Right. Um, should we start with you Cameron? Um, is ours the only universe please, in four minutes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, David. As, uh, as David mentioned, my area is string theory. It's an area where uh, we try to understand the fundamental uh, laws of physics. Uh, what is everything made of and what are the forces between particles and what is the unification of particles and what, there's, what are all these ideas come together. So there's a framework, very mathematical, where many of these ideas seem to fit beautifully and that's in the context of replacing objects which are point particles instead of point particles being fundamental entities, extended objects like strings, one-dimensional and even higher-dimensional ones like membranes, being the fundamental entities instead. And that turns out to be important in trying to reconcile Einstein's theory of general relativity with quantum mechanics. And it has led to a number of predictions, including predictions that people had, uh, had expected. For example, Hawking's uh, predictions about black holes, which were hinted at, but was not quite fully realized until string theory predicted exactly the numbers and the formulas that Hawking was getting in terms of properties of black holes. So there are many aspects of this theory which theoretically have been, have been, uh, have been checked out. Uh, this theory predicts not just one universe, but in fact an infinite number of universes. 10 to the 500 is an underestimation. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, 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 of course, the, ten to the, the popular 10 to the 500 number comes when you try to restrict a specific type of universe from four dimensions maybe, and maybe with properties similar to ours, and within that context there may be this many. People have tried to estimate, I'm not sure how accurate that number may or may not be by, by colleagues who make such estimates, but at any rate, infinite or at least a huge number of possibilities in this theory is predicted, that's for sure. Uh, and we have seen within string theory that there are many possible choices which more or less resembles what we see in terms of the forces and particles and things that we expect in our universe. So it's very natural to expect that that would, that would potentially work the way we think. But to actually pinpoint which, which one we live in and to make exact predictions is very difficult given the multitude of possibilities. So we are not there yet in terms of predicting exactly which one we are. And the hope is by finding some general properties about all of them, perhaps we can say some general lessons from any would-be universe. And one of them, of course, being ours, we would be able to do some facts about our universe as a result. And that's basically the area I'm working in myself. So I think that's a small area. Small <laughs> area. Marvelous. <laughs> Mary Jane. <laughs> so I've got some notes. Good morning. Um, so here's the thing, uh, I, my training is in philosophy and the history of religion and science, so uh, delightfully I'll let the physicists sort of duke it out on their terrain and try to hover a little bit. Um, but I will, I'd like to weigh in quickly to say that epistemologically, that is in terms of what we can know, uh, it seems to me that the multiverse that's a pretty good bet is uninteresting. 
Um, and the multiverse that's interesting is a really kind of weird bet. Um, so here's what I mean. Um, thanks to the inflation that seems to have taken hold just after the Big Bang, there's almost certainly a lot of space time beyond the 40 billion year light, billion light year in radius sphere that we call our visible universe, right? There seems to be more stuff out there. That space time is likely filled with stuff, galaxies, planets, and stars. So we could call those far flung universes uh, within our Big Bang event, but beyond our vision, we could call them other universes if we wanted to. Um, but they'd be no different in principle or in basic composition from our own. Uh, so again, they're not all that interesting. The exciting multiverses are the ones that give us uh, different fundamental constants of nature, different values for gravity, the mass of the electron, the cosmological constant. So I'm thinking here of the infinite bubble universes of eternal inflation, uh, baby universes in black holes, the 10 to the 500 or infinite uh, compactifications of 11 dimensional uh, space. The idea that everybody loves to hate, for example, also that the universe could be two membranes smashing together every once in a while and recreating themselves. Nobody likes that idea, but it's out there. Um, <laughs> These are really cool multiverses, uh, but they, I think affirming their existence requires at least one of two major epistemological leaps that are a problem. One, the first is that the laws of physics that we've derived from our comparatively minuscule visible universe, say quantum field theory, and even our hypotheses about this universe, like inflation, the idea that those processes have to hold beyond, before, outside our Big Bang to account for absolutely everything. That we can take this little bit that we've observed and apply it to something that we can never see. Uh, this is difficult. How would we ever know this? Um, the second assumption would be that mathematical convenience or mathematical elegance somehow imposes the necessity of physical law on us. That because of the mathematics of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, for example, because the mathematics works out, then that means necessarily that the universe has just split into one universe where half of this room just got up and left and got some coffee and then the other, right? Um, it may work mathematically. It doesn't necessarily mean that this imposes a physical reality on us. So insofar as the interesting multiverses are a kind of wonky bet and the <laughs> good bet multiverse is a kind of uninteresting thing. I think the more productive question is, uh, what do we want from a multiverse? Why are we so excited about it? Why are we so interested in it? I think for, um, certainly for, say, science fiction, what we want is a livable universe, like a better universe, a more inter a, a, you know, a universe of justice or a universe of peace or a universe of um, lots of different ways to answer this question. For the ancient atomists in Greece, what they wanted was a way to understand our universe without having recourse to God. And I think that that's what's going on in modern physics. Ooh. But I'll get there. <laughs> <coughs> I've left the ringer right for the end there. John. <laughs> Is, uh, is ours the only universe? Well, yeah, I was going to comment, I kind of fancy the idea of come one as God. <laughs> 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 he, he has that sort of demeanor to him. So uh, when I uh, started graduate school, my professor asked me uh, whether, what sort of thing I wanted to work on. And uh, so one of the options was, was symmetries, relating all sorts of uh, different properties of different particles, you know, think relativity, think, well, anyway, that's a basic building block of our theories. Uh, and string theory is, you know, the you know, epitome of, of symmetry. And then he asked me a second question. He says, well, d do you want to work on the mathematics of symmetries? Or do you want to work on the applications of symmetries to actual phenomena? And I said, applications. And, and that's basically know where I started from and that's where I continue to go. I'm interested in, in theories that can be tested practically uh, and uh, so I've for a long time been involved in uh, accelerator based experiments. Now I'm interested for example in uh, probing general relativity using gravitational waves. So, so where does this put me with this multiverse debate? So I, I guess that basically I'm not so very much interested in the interesting multiverse, which is like was your description, I'm more interested in the boring multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> but because, because that's something which uh, I think is potentially open to test. Right. I think one very important point to mention is that the laws of physics that we uh, have established in our laboratory experiments 
we know that they work to an incredible accuracy out to the most distant stars that we can see in our universe. Uh, you know, the atoms in those very distant stars behave in exactly the same way as atoms uh, in the laboratory. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.